Hi, this is Nick Lloyd, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another interview. Um, this is a really cool one with Nick Lloyd of Nick Lloyd Double Basses. Um, I'll explain in the intro to the interview how we came to get chatting and what the interview is going to be about, but just wanted to say there is also a companion episode that goes along with this, um, which is released at the same time with Paul Coat, bass player from Punch Brothers and Hawktail, talking about the bass that Nick made for him, which is what we discuss in the interview. So if you want to check that one out as well, that's fantastic. Just Paul chatting about why he wanted this bass, why he wanted to work with Nick. Um, so yeah, make sure you check that one out too. Um, and there's going to be links in the show notes to Nick's site and all the bits and pieces we talk about. Uh, yeah, so check this one out. Check out the interview with Paul as well. And that's it. Here comes the interview. So my guest on Bluegrass Gem Along this week is double bass maker Nick Lloyd. And I recently interviewed Paul Coates from Hawktail and Punch Brothers. Um, and after that, I got a, an email from Nick saying, oh, I listened to that episode and I actually made Paul's double bass that he was talking about. Um, and we chatted a bit, and I thought, well, it'd be really cool to get Nick on to talk about that, not just about Paul's bass, but about making basses in general, because it's something I know very little about, and it's a really interesting world. Um, so I'm delighted to say that my guest on Bluegrass Jab Along this week is Nick Lloyd. Hey, Nick. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. It's cool. It's really, it's really interesting. I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, and I'd really like, before we get into any specifics about Paul's bass, to hear a bit about your background because one of the messages you sent me said in it, I've been assembling the skills needed to build it for about 25 years. So I'd love to hear a bit about where that journey started. And, you know, and then we'll talk about, about Paul's specific base later, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, you know, I, I met the double base when I was eight years old. And um, it's just always been by my side. So I wanted to be a professional bassist um, when I, you know, became an adult. And uh, I did that. I was playing in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, in the, in the 1990s. And, and, um, down the street from me, there was a double bass, uh, repairman and he worked in his basement and he did setups and repairs on bases. So I would go over there and he always had bass ale in the fridge. <laughs> um, so it was a good, it was a good match. And I'd go over there and I'd watch, I'd watch him work and, and, and have a bass ale. And, and then I got to talking to him and, you know, it's like, there's a whole industry where you're surrounded by double bass players. And uh, it just sounded perfect because I love the instrument. And I, I mean, double bass players are just some of the best people you ever meet. Um, you know, they want to make the band sound good. Uh, most of them are pretty laid back and uh, you know, they like a good time and they're all about the group. Uh, it's a very supportive role and you get very, you know, warm, supportive personalities in the double bass world. So I studied violin making uh, because someone said, you want to start messing up small pieces of wood. And then if you get good at that, <laughs> you can start messing up big pieces of wood. <laughs> that so, makes sense. Yeah. So uh, I made some violins and, and, and studied double bass restoration and repair and violin making. And then eventually uh, made my first double bass um, and, uh, in, in the late 90s out in, in Utah. And then I opened... Uh, my first shop in Cincinnati in 2000. But in, in Utah, uh, when I was studying violin making and bass making, uh, Edgar Meyer's Uncommon Ritual album came out. I think it was 1997. Um, and that, you know, that album is, it's just, you know, um, it changed everything for a lot of people in the industry. But it was just such a tremendous um, focused album of mm. this is, you know, this is him saying, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. And, uh, yeah, I would listen to it every day for, for weeks and months. And that's when I decided, you know, if I ever get a chance to understand his double bass and his playing, cause it's so unique, uh, and now iconic, um, you know, I, I want to, I would love to copy this instrument that he's playing but I've got to build a lot of instruments before I attempt this. And I knew that, you know, back then, and I was building my first one. Um, you know, I don't want to make one or two bases and then try and try and copy an instrument like his. Um, I knew I'd have to build a, 
a portfolio um, of, of instruments and get all the skills necessary because um, you get you, know, you get one chance with with a player like that. And so it was in the back of my mind, um, you know, just keep making bases, keep getting better, keep listening, keep studying. And then one day, if it presents itself, um, I don't know when that day will be, but it's always on the back burner to, uh, um, to, to copy that instrument. And then that, that back burner, uh, idea kind of came to fruition when I, when I met Paul Cowart. Yeah. And it's uh, that talking about that album Uncommon Ritual is such a kind of landmark recording in acoustic music for so many people and sort mm. of, you know, defined maybe a new, maybe going a little bit far, but it feels like a defined a new role and a new voice for the bass. Um, in, oh, a, in oh, acoustic yeah. music in some way. Yeah. Well, it was so, it was, you know, Edgar had been playing, you know, for years before that, but just the sound of that album uh, and the tunes and the solo and duets and trios that he put together. Um, you know, he had a, a much earlier recording. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it was just called Edgar Meyer, but, um, you know, I, I've, I've told people, I, I think of it like in the movie uh, Beetlejuice, where they're up in the attic and one of the instructions is draw a door and then Alec Baldwin draws a door and then the door opens. And, you know, before Edgar, the door didn't exist. Like this guy mm. drew a door, opened it up, and then created a whole style and genre for other days, other double bass players to just study and then go make a living playing the genre. And, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pivotal moment, um, you know, not just that album, but but him, you know, playing the double bass and, and uh, you know, all the all the work he's done to define his sound and his approach. And so, is that that bass that he plays on a common ritual the one that he's played throughout? Pretty much, is he is he always had that same one? Yeah, yeah that that bass um, that bass was given to him by his father George um, when he was a teenager, and his his dad was a double bassist. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a an old Italian instrument. Uh, dated to 1769, um, and uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot a lot of things special about the instrument, but then also that one person, and this goes with any acoustic instrument, you know, one person's been playing this instrument every day to its incredible potential every day for decades, mm. and w you know whether it's a flat top guitar or a violin or a cello or a banjo, you know, when you've got someone that great playing the same acoustic instrument, you know, um, things happen <laughs> and to that instrument where it just becomes so, so relaxed and seasoned and it sounds tremendous. Um, so, you know, the, the, the few times that I had access to the instrument, it was, you know, it was one of a kind. It, it's, uh, and I've had other, other acoustic musicians that I've talked to that have played, you know, like Tony Rice's guitar, for example, is because um, I know you, you you play guitar and and you love bluegrass so much that it's like it's like drinking from a fire hose. There's all this sound and resonance in the feel. Um, it it's all hitting you that yeah, this was in someone's hands, someone's hands for decades, and that's really that's really special. Yeah, there's something magical about the idea of somebody having a long relationship with one instrument and i know mm. a lot of people spend a long time trying to find that instrument and i guess edgar was was lucky enough to to have that given to him pretty early uh because mm. to spend years and years with one instrument is you know it's a it's a fascinating journey to watch as you know th those iconic instruments like tony's guitar or i guess yeah edgar's bass and things like bill Monroe's mandolin or um mm -hmm. you know it's it's really interesting to to see how much time somebody can spend with something and how much it becomes part of them and they become part of it in a weird way. Um, mm -hmm. So I read that the, the, ba the base you made for Paul was what's known as a bench copy of mm -hmm. Edgar's, which from what I understand, that means that you had access to Edgar's base to sort of take measurements and, and look at it. Yeah. So, you know, for, uh, you know, there's, I, 
I kind of divide copying into three different categories. There's there's museum copies, there's bench copies, and then there's just inspired by copies. And most instruments, when people say, oh, I, I copied this or that, they take the outline and maybe the F holes. And that's about it. And they just go on and make, they make whatever instrument is in their head, but they use the outline of the F holes and, and the instrument. Um, and it ends up just sounding like a bass that they've made. Um, and then in the middle, a bench copy, yeah, I I took my own photographs and measurements um, of, of Edgar's bass. And uh, yeah, I got to spend time with it. And I, you know, I re- reproduced that instrument as much as I could when I made Paul's bass, with the exception of, um, you know, the, the net comes out for flying. Um, so it packs away to a much smaller trunk than a full size bass trunk, which is the, you know, the size of a, a small boat, <laughs> giant yes. fiberglass, fiberglass trunk. So, um, I, I made that one change, but I've kept everything else, um, you know, to the way that I measured it. And then the third kind of copy is a museum copy, which, you know, you see in the, the violin, the great violin makers living, you know, whether it's Stradivari or Guarneri or Amati copies, and they're, you know, every millimeter they're copying the varnish and, and it's just, it's pretty incredible the the level of copying that, that that is. Um, that is not what I did. I, you know, I kind of landed in the middle and I, as much as I could, I, I mimicked the varnish color and some of the antiquing, but uh, it is certainly not a museum copy, uh, which I have the utmost respect for. But yeah, it's 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 definitely more than I just took the outline off the internet, uh, which a lot of folks do, and you got to start somewhere. But uh, but no, that was a it was a really wonderful day. It was September eighteenth, twenty twenty. I'll never forget that date. <laughs> hmm. um, did you get to sort of spend time with Edgar at the same time? Um, no, it was it was Paul and I. Uh, Paul okay. Paul uh, had the base in, in in Paul's house, and so you know we were able to just relax, play the instrument. I was able to measure it, and take photos, and then at the end of the day, we we took the base back to Edgar's house. Uh, they, they both live in Nashville, Tennessee. So I uh, dropped the base off, and we were able to visit for a little bit. Um, but you know, this was the height of COVID. So, you know, yeah. we had all been tested and we all, I wore gloves and a mask and everything. Um, and it was definitely, a, you know, I knew there wouldn't be a, a real big hang cause nobody was hanging, you know, back then. But, um, but it was, I was still thankful that that opportunity, uh, presented itself and, and I was able to, to study the instrument at, at Paul's house and hear Paul play it. That was very informative. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually, because you are making a copy of a particular bass that has been played by the same guy for for years and years, but you are making it for somebody else to play. Um, Mm -hmm. And much as Paul has studied with Edgar and is inspired by Edgar, Paul has his own sound, and you're Mm -hmm. making an instrument for that, I guess. And that, yeah, so I hadn't really thought about that. You're sort of not just copying an instrument, you're creating an instrument for somebody. So it's both ends of that journey need to match up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, I understood that from, from the get go and, and Paul did too, that, you know, this instrument, as much as you can copy, it's, it's going to have its own voice. Um, but there's a real specific um, kind of a, a ballpark tonally that it needed to land in. And it did land in that ballpark. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of things different. Uh, a lot of things are different about Edgar's bass that, uh, you know, a modern bass maker wouldn't just sit down and come up with um, because it is, it is tonally, it is the opposite of what most people have been doing uh, and what most people want, frankly. I mean, you know, and I, I took some notes of your conversation with, with Paul and he distilled it down to clarity versus ringing. And, and, you know, most bassists want ringing because they're, going to be in a section of other bass players and they want to blend you've got six seven eight basses you know playing in unison and they want to sound like one giant bass you know in an orchestra Hmm. well in in this case you've got a double bass that needs to cut through banjo 
tabla, guitar, violin, mandolin. Um, so clarity really is is the best description of what what that bass is doing. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not about ringing. Um, so that's, uh, that was kind of a nice moment that, that, that Paul described. Yeah. It's interesting because I guess it's like, it's, you want different things from a voice that is going to sing solo than you do from a voice that's going to blend in the choir. And, um, mm-hmm. I guess for the, the vast history of double bass playing, double basses have been played in string sections in orchestras and they've been required to blend more than stand out. And so mm-hmm. there's probably a relatively short history of building basses to have a strong solo voice. Yeah, and there, you know, there have been there are great bass soloists now that have a, a have their own voice, and historically there have been great bass soloists. But what's um, what's unique about Edgar's solo sound, um, you know, in addition to the kind of music that he's, I don't want to say created, but um, you know, it's it's a fairly modern music that he's that he's involved with. Um, he doesn't use much vibrato, if any. Um, I mean, and I hear that more drawing from, um, you know, I know he loves Bach and, and early music, and you know the way it's practiced now, the string players, you know, with the with the period instruments and gambas. I know he's very influenced by that, and I can hear it in the sound. There's no vibrato; it's just the note. Um, and even down to the things of the kind of rosin that 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 Paul's using and Edgar is using, you know, it's not your traditional bass rosin that's very very thick. It's a very it's a it's a lighter rosin, uh, and you get a super clean sound uh, off the bow, and uh, that that's huge um, when you're when you're playing a you know instrument with a forty one inch string length. <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, it all adds up um, to a really specific, you know, within within a second or two, you know, it's Edgar Meyer or you know, it's Paul Coward, um, and you know, and 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 Paul's focus is, you know, he wants to he wanted to find a double bass that matched his voice and 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 uh, and his playing, and uh, definitely within th- that style, but. Uh, you know, he said, I, I know it's not going to be exactly the same voice, but it needs to be in this ballpark. So, And just you sort of mentioned before um, about Edgar's bass. And from talking to Paul, I sort of he, he talks a little bit about this, but it has some features that aren't things you would commonly find, find on a double bass made now or, or a lot of double basses made previously. Um, can you talk a little bit about what is unique about Edgar's bass? Well, the um, he's as far as I can tell, he's using the original neck set, um, which on a double bass that's and uh, it's called the overstand, and that's the how far the neck sits out of the body at the neck joint, um, and it's quite low. It's it's eighteen millimeters if you're if you're following along, um, mm-hmm. and most most modern overstands are thirty five to forty millimeters, which is it's it's gotten um, over the last you know twenty thirty years um, the overstand has has grown uh, in double bass luthery and it does make it more playable uh, in thumb position. It also changes the, the the sound of the instrument and the projection. That is how the angle of the fingerboard over the bass. Um, you know he's, he's using uh, the original projection and it's quite low. So what that adds up to is a um, a very tight sounding and tight playing instrument, uh, and most people want a looser, and that lend, lends itself towards a more ringing sound, a more blending sound. Um, yeah, his, his bass is uh, is very clear with a low overstand and a low bridge, and then of course he's using solo strings, which lots of soloists use. Um, for people that don't know what solo double bass strings are, they're just tuned up a whole step. Um, and now he has a C extension on the bottom that stays at C and then going up and register it's C, B, E, and then A. Um, and there's special strings that, that are made for solo basses that, that are tuned up a whole step. So it's naturally tighter 
with the strings, but also with this neck set and, and, and uh, low, low neck projection, it's a very tight instrument that, you know, most people would find uh, difficult <laughs> to, to play. We'll be right back with you just after this. Bluegrass Jam Along is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins. If you're attending the NAMM show in January, stop by the Collings booth to say hello to the team, get hands-on with their selection of customised acoustics and electrics, and check out some exciting new prototypes they're working on for 2024. They'll also have a few of their world-class artists on hand demoing various instruments. And if you can't attend, don't forget to follow their Instagram and Facebook accounts throughout the show for photos, videos, and the latest news. Collings guitars are hand-built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If one of your 2024 resolutions is to improve as a musician, Peghead Nation is the place to go. They have 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music. Courses cover bluegrass, old time, Irish music and swing, plus lessons dedicated to improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 a month and you can add more for $10. Try any course free for a month with the promo code JAMALONG. Make 2024 a year of more music at pegheadnation.com. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's really interesting about the, the sort, of, sort of thing. I, you know, I know a little bit about double bass, but not a lot. And it's, it's certainly would make sense in terms of that kind of voice and helping things sort of stand out a bit. Um, and in terms of the, obviously some physical differences in that bass compared to a lot of basses, um, did, did you also end up using the same wood as, as that bass is made? Or is that something that you sort of, you work out what you've got that will create that sound rather than trying to source something similar? Well, yeah, the, um, the the wood choice used by by Gabrielli when he made it was very traditional. It's a spruce top and maple back and sides, which you know ninety nine percent of the violin family instruments out there are going to be spruce top and and uh, maple back and sides with a maple neck. Um, you get into the bigger instruments, of cello and double bass. Historically, um, there's poplar. There's willow and there's walnut for the back and sides, but the front is is almost always spruce. Um, or in England, they have used pine, but it, you know, spruce family. Um, a soft wood is, is for the top, and then a hard wood for the back and sides. So yeah, um, the wood choice wasn't wasn't anything strange. Um, yeah, I did match. You know, archings are a really big deal in the violin family because the front is arched. And then the back is arched. Uh, on double basses, you can have flat back and you can have round back. This base was uh, is a, a maple round back, but arch arch height and arch style is something that um, violin makers and bass makers that we just kind of obsess about. Um, so I've matched. You know, the the top arch on this on Edgar's base is quite low, and the arching style is quite quite broad. But on the back, the arching is really high and it looks like it was arched by someone totally different a very a lot of recurve um very sculptural style uh arching on the back but yeah the arching in the top and the back are, are different from each other and uh you know i copied all of that and that you know that does inform the sound coming out of the instrument um and i've i've told people that you know um because I don't, and I've not made, you know, mandolins or, or, or flat top, you know, guitars or anything like that. But, um, on, on the violin family instruments, the front is doing 95% of the heavy lifting when it comes to sound production. Um, I mean, you can, you can change the woods for backs and sides, but man, it's, it's the front and how it's arched and how it's thinned. Um, that's, uh, and then F hole placement too. Those, those components are, are informing the sound more than um, the what kind of backs and sides are, are being used. And that that point about the top doing most of the work and being thin, um, I've talked to guitar makers about this before, but like presumably within the violin, cello, double bass world, there are instruments around that have lasted far longer than any guitar 
is likely to have lasted. And mm-hmm. that um, that sort of balance between a thin resonant top and volume and an instrument that is actually going to last to be played in another hundred years must be a, a sort of a difficult balance to achieve. But it is. And, and, you know, there's also a, 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 a they continue that, that same thinking. A lot of the great old instruments, especially with the, you know, Stradivari, Guarneri, Amati, the, the very high end instruments, a lot of them have been re-arched because arches fall over the years. So, you know, there's a whole lineage of luthiers that have maintained these great instruments, even simple repairs all the way up to really complicated repairs and re-arching to keep these things alive. Um, so at what point, you know, as, as you could say, what point does a Stradivari stop being a Stradivari if it's been, you know, re-arched and doubled? Um, and it's, and it's a whole other conversation to get into, but on, on Edgar's base, you know, from, from what I could tell that the, um, the top has sunk a little bit. You, you always see a little bit of sinkage. Uh, I don't see any signs of it having been rearched. Um, I do know people that rearch double base tops. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. Um, but yeah, these, these arches do sink and fall and they get pressed out and doubled and, and, and beefed up over over the hundreds of years. So I have re- double base restoration or any any restoration um, is uh, just, it's so admirable. And, and, and the work that these luthiers do, I mean, is incredible because they're, you know, they've got to go in and and execute this high end restoration work and then have it be as minimally invasive as as possible. So yeah, my, my my hat is off if you are a, a instrument restorer. That's and that's a really interesting thing as well. Just um, that level of you know the the work that has been done on some of these violin family instruments because the sort of a lot of the modern conversation around guitar and like pre war guitars and mandolins that mm. are you know very few of them are less, uh, more than a hundred years old um, and there's a people are looking for things that are in you know, original condition, original mm-hmm. parts, original, like, and instruments are tools and they, they're used to work and they fail and they crack and all these things. And, you know, the, the level of change you're talking about on an old violin potentially is a huge percentage of what the original instrument was. And I, I heard Chris Thiele on an interview sort of saying, you know, it's nuts in the violin world, people replace things if they need replacing. In the mandolin mm-hmm. and guitar world, people are terrified about replacing anything because then it's non-original. He said, like, this is a tool. It was built to be played. It was built to be used. If the jig that cut a fretboard in the original factory was slightly off, of course I'm going to replace it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I have a, another another friend who does uh, guitar restoration, and he said, you know, these Mark guitars, they didn't have truss rods. So you know, a lot of these necks will warp. Well, if you take the fingerboard off and put in – just a lightweight carbon fiber rod. You can't see it from the outside, but you get that neck straight and you put in a carbon fiber rod and put the fingerboard back on. The value will drop, even though you've now made the instrument more healthy <laughs> and, and and more playable. Um, so yeah, it's a it's all these subtleties of of these different industries can be a little uh, a little crazy. Uh, hmm. But yeah, and the yeah you in a double bass if if a neck is warping and it's too, and the fingerboard wears down, you know, because there's no frets and say, hey, get a new fingerboard. It's not a big deal. Um, or a top gets rearched. It's not a big deal. If it's, you know, if it's done correctly, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I've been told it's the collectors of the, of the guitar, you know, the flat top guitar world that have really driven, um, you know, these things we just talked about kind of driven that, that home. So I'm, I'm thankful. I, I'm not in the flat top guitar world. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it still puts me in mind of something else I've heard you talking about um, mm. in regards to instruments and how things have potentially changed over the years. I heard you in an interview, I can't remember where it was now, but talking about essentially the fact that a lot of um, old basses were being cut down to size mm. to make them playable because not only is an instrument a tool and it needs, you know, it needs to last and it needs to function. Also, mm. player comfort and the size of an instrument um, is something that, people have thought about a lot more in recent years 
Yeah. And that's, you know, that goes back to, um, you know, the, the player to my, my philosophy is that the player decides what the instrument will be and what, you know, the forms, um, the, the bass has become more ergonomic over the last hundred years because the players demand it. And there are some big, beautiful bases that have been cut down because the players are like, I can't, I can't get into thumb position, um, on this instrument. And, uh, and I've got another friend who's a maker and he believes that some of the best double bases that have ever been made are being made right now because the playing has just gotten so good. And the players and uh, the, the, the players are demanding so much that uh, the instruments follow suit. Um, mm. So yeah, I've, I've because I grew up playing and, and I've seen I've I've seen the compromises that players make, and then it adds up. Years and years of compromising can add up to back problems and arm problems and hand problems. Um, so it's like, well, I've got a. I've got a blank slate in front of me. How can I make an instrument that is really comfortable for a player so that when they step up and play, there's no, there's no compromises. They're just driving a wonderfully designed instrument for them, even for their left hand. I, you know, string lengths vary on a double bass from 39 inches up to 42 inches. And the first question I'll ask a, a, a customer is, you know, where is your left hand comfortable? And then we go from there because when your left hand is comfortable, you can be as loud as you want and you're playing in tune. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really important part, uh, part of the process. But yeah, if you're, if you're five foot two and you're playing on a long string length, you're going to develop some problems. So this is something I've always, always been focused on. I'd be really interested to hear, um, like as a guitarist and a sort of sometime mandolin player, I, you know, yeah. I understand a bit about how guitars are built. I understand a bit about how mandolins are built, but I'd be really interested to hear sort of what the process is when you're making a bass in terms of like partly sort of which order things come in, but also are you, do you, you know, work on multiple bases at one time? Do you work on one till it's done? Um, you know, well, I'd just be really keen to hear some of the process because it's something I'm fascinated by. Oh, well, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm building full time. Um, I don't do repairs or, or restorations of old instruments. So I'm able to focus all my energy on building and I, I build two at a time. It, it suits me. Um, so, you know, the, the first thing I do is I, I carve scrolls. Um, and that's, you know, there's a, you know, you use a bandsaw and, and a few power tools to get it down to the point where you can, you know, the, the, the scroll carving is all done by hand with gouges. So I'll spend about 10 days or two weeks building, carving two scrolls, and then I'll set those aside. And then um, I'll make the body. And that's, uh, you know, bending the, the sides. Um, I bend those just on a large iron with a strap, and I just clamp it to a bench and I bend it. Some people use counterforms, like in guitar making and molds. Uh, to bend the ribs. Um, but yeah, I just, I bend the ribs by hand and then I've got an inside mold. Um, and, uh, I get the rib structure. We call it the rib structure. I get that finished. I transfer that outline to the plates. The plates are the joined top and the joined back. And, uh, I do all, I do all the arching of the instrument first. And then that, that's the outside curves. And then I flip that plate over and then I thin out, um, those plates and, uh, in double basses and violin family instruments, we have uh, a one bass bar. It's known as, you know, top bracing and arch top guitar making. Um, so there, I cut the F holes in a thin top and I put in the bass bar. It's chalk fitted, glued in. And then kind of the most exciting step of one of them is, it's called closing the box where the top plate and the back plate and the rib structure, they all come together and get glued finally. Um, that's called closing the box. And then I'll finish up with my edge work and, uh, install the purfling. That's that small, um, strip of, of material that's let into the top and the back. It's kind of like binding on a guitar. Yeah, yeah. 
but it's not on the outside edge. It's kind of inside a few millimeters. And then um, set the neck. Then I'll finish the, the, the heel of the neck where your left hand uh, holds the instrument and plays. And then uh, do the varnish. I varnish in a set of sawhorses, kind of like a rotisserie chicken. Hmm. Um, and then uh, so I'll do the varnish and then um, full setup. And then if a customer requests it, there's a C extension, which is this uh, uh, bit of kit, as, as you say, off the E string. It allows the bass player to play E flat, D, D flat, and C. So the C extension is usually made of ebony, and there's four levers. Um, it's a lot of work. It's like I build the double bass, and then I build a clarinet because I'm working in ebony <laughs> and <laughs> aluminum, and I have a milling machine. It's very, very tight tolerances, and if you get it wrong, it buzzes. It's uh, it's a lot of work for four notes, I tell you. Um, but uh, yeah, then the C extension is made and then it's done. Um, so that's, you know, that's how to make a double bass in four minutes. And presumably it takes slightly longer than four minutes. <laughs> how long does it take on average yeah. to make a, an instrument? Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing two uh, every six months. Okay. That's, that's what suits me. And so one of the, just talk there about the neck joints um, mm. and the neck set and mm. Uh, and that's another thing I, I sort of heard you say in the interview I listened to that you said the neck joint is the heart and soul of the instrument and it's a really fragile mm -hmm. joint. And I found that fascinating because that makes a lot of sense that the neck set would be really important on a, on a, a base, but in a world where you're making bases where the necks come off mm -hmm. so people can transport them more easily, how, how easy was that to accommodate and what does it, how does it affect the instrument? Well, it's, uh, there's there's a bunch of different um, a bunch of different methods that are in practice right now of of these travel necks or removable base necks um, and it's, some are better than others uh, to be frank and there's a, a gentleman a base maker in Canada named Jim Ham who came up with this uh, really elegant system. And I saw it in, the, in 1996 in Utah at a violin making convention. And uh, he presented it to everyone there. And I thought, well, this is, this is really interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to wait, you know, 10, 15, 20 years and see how the community reacts because this is a fairly, um, you know, back then it was a, it was like some next level stuff, you know, kind of Star mm -hmm. Trek, like, wow, <laughs> this is, this is amazing. And then I wanted to hear um, how the community reacted. And, you know, nobody, nobody ever had a problem with this particular design uh, and this particular uh, removable neck system. So after all those years, I, I contacted Jim and, and asked if he would, you know, teach me his, his process and share that with me. Um, and it uses carbon fiber in the neck, which makes the neck stiffer. And that translates to a little more mid range and a little more sustain. So, uh, the effect is, is positive for the double bass. Um, there are a number of systems where it's, they just take the, uh, take a neck out and then you put a bolt through the heel of the wood and it sets into a threaded insert inside the body. That's a fairly simplistic, uh, solution. Um, but you're still going to have, you know, uh, there's other issues with that that I, you know, for longevity that I don't like. Um, but this, this carbon fiber that, uh, that Jim has, has taught me, taught me and it's, it's really, uh, it makes the neck even more rigid, which, which I like. So I've done two, two retrofits on, um, Lloyd bases that have come back and, uh, the, either the one, uh, Southwest Airlines broken neck on a double base. Cool. So, yeah, I like to say that I had a collaboration job with Southwest, and they took the neck out, and then I got to put <laughs> it back in. <laughs> um, Probably the yeah, best way around. It is. It well, it was. Uh, it's quite a bit of work to do a retrofit, but I I know this particular instrument really well, so uh, it was fun to hear the bass come back to life and how the sound had developed. And yeah, the owner was just so happy. It's like the the the, the voice has not gotten worse. If anything, it's it's gotten better. Um, 
so that's uh that's what I do. But yeah, it's it's the things that violin makers don't have to go through. I mean, they're not have to you know, take necks out and and worry about you know, am I going to be overweight? Am I going to be oversized? You know, you, you show up at a uh, at a baggage uh, counter when you check in, and you just give them your credit card and and pray like. <laughs> this is, yeah. a, is it going to be $50? Is it going to be $500? You, you never know until that very moment. And I, it's, uh, it's a little nerve wracking, but you know, it's what we go through. Yeah. And, and for a player, you know, like Paul, who's traveling all mm -hmm. over the world, having an instrument that he loves and is prepared to take on a plane and knows that it's going to be safe. is obviously a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh I mean, he's he's checking a neck off case and a neck a neck off trunk, um, and I I know other bass players that have you know very expensive antique instruments. They just buy two tickets, and hmm. they'll buy two first class tickets. So you know that's a that's a you know an extreme end of it. Uh, but I know a lot of cello cello players and symphonies will just buy two two coach tickets. You know, you can get a cello into a, a coach seat. Um, and, uh, and I've heard horror stories that, you know, some, um, some gate agents will say, you know, even though you have a ticket for that cello, we're not going to let it sit in that seat. You know, it's like a $500,000 cello that now has getting checked. Ugh, it's, uh, the this, this stuff that they go through, but yeah, but yeah, Paul is, Paul is flying everywhere with his neck off, uh, neck off base. And, uh, you know, for that, for that level that, that Paul is playing at with Hawktail and Punch Brothers, you know, doing bass du jour is what we lovingly call it. When you show up at a festival and there's, there's a bass there for you to play, you know, uh, a lot of bass players will do that because uh, they don't want the hassle of flying with their own, own instrument. But on the level that, that, that Paul's playing and original music and using the bow a lot, it's, uh, you know, it. It, it really fits his style of playing and the, and the demands he puts on instruments. Uh, he's got to have a, a high performance double bass, but I know a lot of jazz players and bluegrass players, they'll, they'll bring a pickup, maybe a, a realist pickup and uh, maybe a favorite G string or D string mm -hmm. uh, and just swap out two strings and put a pickup on the back line bass du jour, you know, and play the set or the weekend with it. And then, take their pickup and take their strings when they, uh, when they leave the gig. So that's another way to do it. I love the idea of turning up at a gig with your own strings, but no instrument. Yeah. That sounds funny. It's yeah. like I've been, been a drummer back in the day and turning it with your own cymbals. <laughs> it's a lot like that. Yeah. I've, I've done a bit of touring and I play uh, gut strings um, on the G and D the, the first and second string. And that's a really specific sound. So I, I just bring gut strings and a realist pickup. And, uh, I know how to change strings and not drop the sound post. Um, so and it takes me, you know, 15 minutes and then I'm able to you know, get a sound on stage. That is the sound that I like, but, uh, I wasn't playing anywhere near the level <laughs> that, that, that Paul Coward is. But that still brings up an interesting point, actually talking about changing strings in the sound post and mm -hmm. like with the, with, taking the neck off regularly on a bass, what does that do to tension? And how do you get around that if the, suddenly the body isn't under the amount of tension it's been under? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole other uh, can of worms. So what I do is I find a sound post position that the player likes, first of all, and then I put one drop and I mean drop one tiny drop of hot hide glue. That's what we use to make, you know, these instruments is hot hide glue. So I put one drop of hot hide glue on the top of the post. And then I put the post in the instrument. The, and so then when tension comes off the instrument, that post is going to lift up off of the back plate on the inside of the box. The top of the post is not going to twist or move in any way, which is really important because if it, the top of the post twists just a little bit and then pressure comes back on, now that post becomes a wedge into the spruce top and you can get a sound post crack. So the, the top of the post is not going to twist. The back of the post, um, through the F holes, I have two, I place two uh, kind of half moon shaped pieces of spruce 
They're about 10 millimeters tall. Uh, and those are very lightly with uh, hot hide glue. Those pieces are glued to the back plate of the, of the base, but not to the sound post. And they act as shoulders or, or a guide, if you will, so that when tension comes off the instrument, the post lifts up off the back and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so I've been doing this method for over 10 years um, and people fly with their bass and the sound post, sound post never drops. They don't have to think about it. And then later, if they want to get a sound post adjustment, all of this work can be knocked down by a good luthier with a sound post setter because hide glue has a quality of that it's very brittle. Uh, it's strong, but it's brittle. So it's easy to undo a hide glue joint, wash it off with a bit of warm water, and then you can uh, find a new post placement. Um, there are other solutions that people use, like a strap to uh, keep tension on the instrument. Um, one guy tried putting a pin to the top, which scared everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think he, he quit doing that after a couple of years. But, but yeah, this, this method, you know, players aren't luthiers. Um, and, and setting a sound post is pound for pound one of the most difficult things to do correctly. Because if you get it off just a millimeter or a few degrees, um, suddenly, as I said before, that sound post becomes a wedge. So um, I just use really weak hot hide glue, and uh, you know, as I say, Bob's your uncle. It's 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 pretty easy. And so for the um, the kind of less aware of us, and I very much include me in that category. What mm -hmm. um, what's the function of the sound post? Because you talk about the placement that the player likes. Um, mm -hmm. How does it how does it affect the tone based on where it is situated? Yeah, so um, in in the violin world, you've got a bass bar under the, you know, the under the bass foot, and then you've got a sound post, um, and it's doing a couple things. If you have no sound post and you had just say another brace, you would have this very, very ringing open sound, like a guitar, but there's a lot of focus in the sound. Uh, because of that sound post, it's a, it's a point of no vibration, uh, the, the, the top of the post where it meets the spruce. Now I shouldn't say no, but it's almost nil. Um, so by bringing, by placing the sound post in relationship to that treble foot, you can voice the instrument to be brighter or you can voice the instrument to be bassier. Um, and that all depends on the kind of strings being used and is the player a jazz player or a classical player or a soloist. Um, there's a lot you can do with the voicing of a violent family instrument and sound post placement. Um, I mean, that's the, that's kind of the uh, uh, generic description of what a sound post does, but, but yeah, that it also, it, add, it adds a tremendous amount of focus to the overall sound versus an instrument with no sound post at all. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah, they would be loud, but it wouldn't, wouldn't have a lot of projection. And, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you what year, you know, sound post w started being used in the history of instrument making, but, um, but yeah, it's been around for hundreds of years and, uh, yeah, it, it does add a lot of projection. That's really interesting. Um, I had one question I was I was really keen to ask you about about wood, sure. um, because I saw something that you said that basically that the answer to creating consistently great bases is to acquire enough tone wood to make several bases out of, so that you mm. sort of learn not just what a certain type of wood does, but how a specific log or a specific tree actually responds mm. to being worked. And I thought it was fascinating because I've talked to guitar builders and read lots about this and wood is a really interesting subject particularly now as supplies change and but the idea of acquiring enough wood to really develop a relationship with that specific log i thought was really a really mm -hmm. cool sort of a cool thought yeah I mean, it's um um i just want consistency of material um so you know if you buy 10 different tops from 10 different woodcutters you know, you're, you're kind of putting yourself at a disadvantage. Um, 
and also for economies of scale, to be frank, you know, if, if, uh, if I approach a woodcutter and say, you know, I want, I want 15 or 20 tops. Well, I'm, I'm going to get the best price. <laughs> um, mm. if you're just buying one at a time, it, it becomes, it becomes pretty expensive, pretty quick with double base. Um, I also, you know, in buying a lot of wood from one cutter, invariably you're, you're going to be buying wood that is really young. Um, so you've got to sit on it, uh, to let it, to let it season. And, uh, by rule of thumb, it's one inch per year. So a neck block is four inches thick. So, you know, I buy a chunk of maple for a, a scroll or a neck. I'm not going to use it for at least four or five years. So, um, you know, I have a whole room, uh, dedicated in my shop. It's just wood storage and everything is dated. Um, so there's, there's boards that I can get into right now. And there's boards that I've got to wait another year or two. Um, but, um, but no, it's like, especially with the, with the spruce, which is, um, you know, like I said before that the, the front does all the heavy lifting. Um, yeah, I, I want to leave as much wood as I can and have a really resonant instrument. Um, there's a, there's a, a an unfortunate phenomena, uh, of, of the wolf tone <laughs> hmm. that, uh, and that's, it's not so much, uh, uh, in, in guitar making, I know it exists, but it's, it's more in the boat instrument world where the note coming out of the box and the note being played aren't exactly the same note. And then the sound waves don't line up acoustically. And then you get this fighting, warbling, wolfy sound. Um, so if a top is really, really thin, uh, oftentimes you'll have a, have one, two or more wolves. Thankfully in the, in, in our world, there's a saying of, you know, every good base has at least one wolf. So mm. I think you're allowed, <laughs> I know you're allowed a wolf, but it can't be on an open string. You know, if you get an open G wolf, you've got to, you've got to do some setup adjustments and get that wolf moved. Uh, and you can, you can move, move wolves around by doing setup adjustments. You can move it to a flat. Uh, is a, is an okay place because it's a closed note on the fingerboard. Um, but yeah, a really thin top. Um, and I've seen a number of modern makers that, you know, they want to get the loudest sound possible. So they make a thin top and then they get a wolfy top. Um, or, you know, I'm on the other side of it is like, I want to, I'll get a, a fair amount of wood. Uh, and I still get a great, in, a great instrument and a great sound. But then, you know, the wolves are, are kind of at bay or at least uh, very well hidden. So these are, these are the kind of things that I'm focused on and, and why I like to buy um, a bunch of woods, uh, sorry, a bunch of tops from the same log. Hmm. So, you know, I've, I've got a working experience of how thick and how thin I can make the top. I mean, when we started out this conversation, one of the, um, hmm. the last things I thought we'd be talking about was relocating wolves. That's, <laughs> that's fascinating. <laughs> It gets it gets pretty geeky pretty quick. <laughs> I love it. I love this stuff. Um, oh, cheers. And and so like sort of to loop back to where we started, we start sort of talking about copying a bass for Paul. Um, and you, you know, sitting with him and hearing him play Edgar's bass, and mm -hmm. then sort of him taking delivery of of this instrument at the end. And so it sounds like you know talking about the um, sound posts and stuff. There's a, a bit of a process with the player to set the instrument up to their sort of final specs at the end of it as well um what was that like sort of turning up with you know here's the base we've been talking about all this time uh oh so you're asking me what it was like to have it to finish it yeah and just to sort of present paul with this thing that had been you know an idea in his head for a long time to present him with a, a sort of reality <laughs> and and how that mm. you know yeah well it was um i mean i was really of course, really excited because um, I, you know, I, I had built two other bases um, for Paul of my own, my own model, you now my own arching, my own neck set, and um, you know, I was, I was getting closer. It was kind of like a Goldilocks situation, but that third one was like, okay, it's like, what exactly are you looking for? And then, you know, spending time. And realizing, wow, this is 
Edgar's instrument is is so different. Um, so I, I knew I've, I was pretty confident actually that I can I can get in the ballpark and I've I've got this sound. And in that first year of Paul playing it, and this is true with with any player um, that that first year of going from summer to fall to winter to spring, you know, one full change of all the seasons. That's a big year for an acoustic instrument. Um, and, uh, you know, doing some sound pulse adjustments here and there throughout that year uh, to, you know, to get it dialed in and then fingerboard camber, which is the length of the of a fingerboard is it's not flat. There's a, there's a scoop that we can call it a scoop or a camber, um, you know, uh, changing camber on a fingerboard, especially a double bass fingerboard really, uh, can really open up certain registers, uh, can make it more comfortable for the player, but they, they have to spend time with the instrument and then kind of come back and say, okay, you know, I need, I need this little last 1% adjusted. Um, but no, like right off the bench, I was just really tickled and very happy that uh, that all of uh, all of my instincts and all of my measurements and all of my planning had had come had come to fruition. T- to be honest, because um, it is, uh, you know, um, I, I had built fifty four bases before number fifty five, which is Paul's, um, and I felt like okay, I've I've finally assembled all the skills and the skills for varnishing. Um, it's one thing to make an instrument, you know, in the white, as we say, all the woodworking is done and then you varnish it. Um, I, you know, I wanted the thing to look, look like a proper bench copy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was really, I was really excited and, uh, yeah, it was like, wow, I, (laughs) I pulled it off (laughs) after all those, all those years from, you know, from 1997, it was quite a while. There's something um, so beautiful and uh, maybe even a bit romantic in that is the idea that you would heard this record all that, all those years back and thought that's a wonderful bass sound. I'd love to make a copy of that bass at some point. And I'm mm-hmm. maybe one day I'll be ready. And then mm-hmm. sort of Paul comes along hugely inspired by the same player and the same sound and you get together and over the course of, you know, several years develop a relationship, building a couple of bases mm-hmm. for him, and then that point where, like, the thing that you'd wanted to do coincided with the thing that somebody else wanted you to do, and the mm-hmm. moment that all drops, there's something under. But and you know, going back beyond that to 1769 when this base was first born, and there's something um, just endlessly romantic about the the idea of a story of an instrument, and you know, other instruments inspired, and what might happen next, you know. Yeah, and you know the the Edgar's bass when it was made, it didn't it didn't sound like it does today. I I can definitely guarantee that. Um, but all we all we have is what's in front of us. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's incredibly romantic. It's what keeps me coming to work every day. Is that you know um, I I my plan is that my instruments will be around long long after I'm here. Um, and I, you know, I don't have kids. These, these bases are my, <laughs> they are my kids. Uh, it, it is, yeah, it's very romantic and I'm just super happy. I get to make instruments, um, in, in, you know, for, for a living for these players. It's, it's, it's great. And there's something just remarkably humbling and humble about building something that is going to have a life long after you do. So the idea of just you go and stand in a, you know, I, I'm over in the UK and you go and stand in some of the mm-hmm. gardens of stately homes that have been designed by somebody like Capability Brown and you mm-hmm. know that they're planted trees and they're never going to see what this looks like because they've been gone long before it's grown to the shape it was intended to. And the mm-hmm. idea of pouring a load of love and a load of work into something that will be, you know, in another 250 years, who knows what Paul's bass will sound like and he'll be playing it. Yeah, I I had this. Uh, it's like the first time I I was kind of overwhelmed by that that feeling. I I uh, back when I was doing repair and restoration, um, I was working on a double bass. I'd taken the top off, and you know that's how you get to the inside of the instrument. You take the top off, and um, this bass was built. Um, this is like seventeen seventeen eighteen. This is before the founding of the United States. Right, and. And in this box, there were 
I could see seven different luthiers spent time doing repair and restoration work. And some of that work was outstanding. And there was some other work that was, let's call it average at best. You know, it's like some people phoned it in and other people really showed up to the bench that day. But again, it was 300 years of other people's work and they were all looking at me. This work was looking at me and asking me, are you going to do a good job here today? You know, you're, you are just one person that I visited on this old instrument and it forces you. It's like, you're, you better do a good job with me. And, and I like to do that when I'm making that if, if someone, when someone comes along, you know, a, a luthier later, do I just do a sound post adjustment or, or close a crack that they see that, you know, this guy took some time to, to build this base. So please take some time to repair it. <laughs> um, and uh, that's all, you know, that's all you can ask for. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's really beautiful. And that feels like a, sort of a lovely place to to bring this to an end i think that's a lovely sentiment to finish with um thanks so much for taking the time to do this i've really enjoyed it oh yeah it's great fun it's nice to nice to hang out Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.